So I want to start today with a story. You probably know uh, last month my family and I, we were in Vanuatu, and for the first time we went to one of the islands in the north, an island called Santo. It's the, I think it's geographically the biggest island, it's the second most populated island, and we'd not been there before in all our time in Vanuatu, and so uh, we wanted to go there. And I've got some friends that have been, and they said, you've got to go to a place called Port Orly. Um, it's up on the coast, you, it's probably an hour and a half drive or something like that. I said, it's absolutely stunning, the best fish and chips that you'll ever have. And so we decided, all right, we're going to rent a car and we're going to drive up there one day. So we went up to Port Orly, you'll see it on the screen, it's a beautiful place. It's just a great reminder of God's fingerprint and how majestic his creation is. I think sometimes, you know, we can forget that. So anyway, we're there, we swam and we ate lunch and we enjoyed the warm weather and it was just a really enjoyable, relaxing time as a family. On the screen, that is me just sitting there watching my kids swimming in the ocean. Um, I'm, you know, just uh, have had lunch. I think I was looking forward to an afternoon nap. That didn't happen because we had to go and get to a place called Champagne Beach, which was almost as beautiful. So 36 hours later, we're leaving Santo. And uh, when we arrived, we met a man named Charlie, who was a, um, a, he was a taxi driver, so he took us to our hotel. And I'd organised with Charlie, I had a good conversation with him and you know, he knew I was a pastor and things like that. And organised with Charlie to come and pick us up on the Thursday morning when we were going back to Port Vila. And so it was 6am because the flight was like 8.30 or something like that. And um, then this little blue sort of van arrives which is a taxi. And we're like, this isn't Charlie's Hilux, what's going on here? This must be for someone else. And so the guy comes out and he says, oh, you know, are you such and such? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, he said, oh, yeah, I'm, uh, Charlie sent me to take you to the airport. I said, okay, fantastic. Don't mind how we get to the airport as long as we get there and get on the plane. So I'm chatting to him on the way through and um, he goes, I know you. And like, I've never been to Santo before and I've met, you know, like three people. He goes, I know you. Yeah, I saw you on Tuesday up at Port Orly because I was there with some other tourists and I was taking them and I saw you and I was having lunch when you were having lunch and I started to freak out a little bit because in my mind I'm going, what has this man seen? What has he been watching? Like, and so I've had to sort of like reflect and go, how did I actually behave at that time? You know, like, like was, was I good or was I not good? And um, so a lot of things are just going through my mind at this point of time. And I sort of really just had this flashback sequence, you know, in terms of how things were. But it really led me to today's message. And so I want to bring a message today which is called The World is Watching. Okay, The World is Watching. Because... Um, well, we're going to be in Ephesians 4. If you've got your Bibles, you want to turn to Ephesians 4, that's where we're camping in terms of Scripture today. Um, but as Christians, as followers of Jesus, our lives are on display. If you've made a public declaration that Jesus is your Lord and Saviour, your life is on display to the world that is around you. Uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, it tells us that we are ambassadors of Christ. We represent Jesus in all that we do. Whether that's on the beach at Port Orly, in northern Vanuatu, whether that's in church, wherever it is, you are representing Jesus. Now, for some, when I say the world is watching they actually have an international platform. You know, they've got a ministry that is worldwide. Think of, you know, your Joyce Myers or your Jensen Franklin or your Joseph Prince or whoever you want to insert there that you know has a global audience. So quite literally, the whole world is watching them. And you might think today, well, that's all right. I don't have a global ministry. I don't have an international platform. It doesn't matter. But your world is watching wherever you are. When you go to the supermarket, people are watching. If you go to the doctor, people are watching. Wherever you go in your world here in Southern Lake Macquarie, people are watching. The world is watching what is taking place. They're watching how you act. They're watching what you say. They're watching how you say it. They're watching how you interact with other people. 
They're watching what you don't say. The world is watching. But don't do like I did and start freaking out and think, oh, because what I want to do today is I want to equip you. I want to give you some tools that we can represent Jesus well, that we can be his ambassadors and we can represent him well. So, be assured the world is actually watching. And it's important because the outcome for those that don't know Jesus can go one of two ways. It can actually, they can look at you and it can be a positive outcome. They can think, huh, I like this Jesus. Or it can actually be a negative. They can think, hmm, I'm not sure if that's what Jesus looks like, I'm not sure I want him in my life. And that's why it's so very, very important for us to continually remind ourselves the world is watching. The world is watching. Just like John the Baptist, we've got an opportunity as the church, we've got an opportunity to make the the road straight, to make the path straight to Jesus. Or it can be a rocky road that they may never get to the point where they meet Jesus. Now, I don't want you to freak out right now. As I said, I'm going to give you some tools. But here are some truths that I want you to understand. You could be the difference between reception and deception. You could be the difference between someone receiving Christ as Lord and Saviour or continuing to be deceived by the enemy. You could be that difference. What an opportunity that is for you and for me to be that difference. You could be the difference between redemption and rebellion redeemed by the blood of Jesus or rebelling against the blood of Jesus. That could be you and what the world sees in you. It all comes down to how you live, to what you say. What are people seeing in you as Christ's ambassador? And so what I want to do is I want to turn to Ephesians 4 and I want to actually look there and I want to equip you with some tools to navigate through the world where you and I are being watched as followers of Christ because one of the other differences that you and I can make is you and I can be the difference between heaven and hell you and I can be the difference between an eternity in the loving arms of our heavenly father or in the fiery pit of damnation it's a bit of a weight that we carry isn't it and so why it's so very important that I want to give you some tools is that so we don't see it as a weight Okay, we don't see it as a weight, but we see it as an opportunity. We see it as our chance to be able to show Jesus to the world that is watching us. Sadly, here's a truth. The world wants to catch us out. As soon as you make a public uh, declaration that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, the world that is watching, they just want to watch you and they want to pick up on any small detail they can and go, see, That's not very Christian. That's the world that we live in. But do you know what? Jesus lived in that world. John the Baptist lived in that world. All those that have gone before us, it's the world that they lived in as well. News reports. I saw just very briefly, very briefly, I didn't actually see what the report itself was about, but it was a, a snippet on TV And there was a a bit bit of a kerfuffle taking place, you know, and it was one of those sort of current affairs ones, you know, where they chase someone with a camera and stuff like that. And then, you know, I think the person they were chasing, you know, was trying to get out of there, so maybe just, you know, did this and sort of, you know, gently pushed someone to the side. And the reporter yells out, well, that's not very Christian of you. Because what does the world do? The world takes its little bit of knowledge of the Bible or the gospel or God and they take it out of context and they use it for their own purposes. A long time ago, someone said to me, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. And that's why we as the church, we cannot take his word out of context because then when we, we are no better than the world it's, that we live in. We have to make sure that it is always in context. Or I love when people go, well, what would Jesus think about that? What would Jesus think about what you just said or did? I'm like, well, I know him personally. You don't. I know him and here's what he would think. You have my grace. 
you have my love, you have my understanding, and you are a work in progress. He is not expecting me, he's not expecting you to be perfect, but he's expecting us to be our perfect selves as we represent him. It doesn't mean that we are perfect. Amen? I love in Matthew 12, Jesus is in the synagogue, and it's on the Sabbath, you know, and Jesus was, knew the world around him, was watching, he always knew that. And so he heals a man on the Sabbath. And in verse 12, the Pharisees, they want to get Jesus. They want to put him in a corner. They want to say, see, you're doing the wrong thing. And here's what it says, Matthew 12, verse 10. The Pharisees asked Jesus, does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? Ha, gotcha, Jesus. Gotcha. And then it continues, they were hoping he would say yes so they could bring charges against him. That's no different than what the world that we live in. It wants to bring us down as the church, as God's ambassadors, so that it can justify its own action, its own actions. Okay, what do the Pharisees do after that? If you continue reading, they plot to kill Jesus. For what reason? Because he healed a man? Is that worthy of someone's death because you've you've brought someone out of a place of bondage and sickness and you've brought them to a place of freedom is that worthy of death no but that's what the pharisees wanted to do they plotted to kill jesus why because in their eyes he had done the wrong thing he'd healed on the sabbath and that's just one example you can go through scripture there's a whole bunch there all right so let me give you some examples of how the world is watching and this is not in ephesians 4 we will get there i promise you And then I will give you some answers from Scripture. Is that okay? Here's the first one. The world is watching how we respond to trials and difficult circumstances. We sang a song today about the victory that we have in Jesus. And so Scripture tells us that we have the victory because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so when the world is watching, they want to see a body of believers that are living victoriously. But sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're not living victoriously. Sometimes we're allowing our circumstances to actually bring us down into that place of despair or bondage or whatever you want to call it, defeat. But that's not what Scripture says. Because when we do that, do you know what we do? We undervalue the cross. We undervalue the sacrifice that Jesus made. Because Scripture tells us that we already have the victory. We were victorious as Christ died on the cross in Calvary. 1 Corinthians 15.57 says this, It is sin which gives death its power, and it is the law which gives sin its strength. May I remind you, we no longer live under the law. We are under a new covenant of grace. But listen, all thanks to God then who gives the victory over these things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, is that how the world sees you? Do they see an ambassador of Christ who is living in the victory that he died to give them? Because if they do, do you know what? That'll be attractive to them. They'll be like, hmm, I want some of that. I want some of that. I want some of that. The world is also listening to what we say and how we say it. Are our words filled with love and with grace and forgiveness and compassion? Or is our talk no better than the language of the world? I was talking to Brian and Deb. They were at the football the other night. And one of the things they said, the language was horrendous. That is the world that we live in. But that is not who you and I are. That is not we as ambassadors of Christ. That is not what we are instructed to do. We are instructed to do what it tells us in Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Are your words full of grace? Are they seasoned with salt? Sometimes might aren't. And I've got to continually remind myself, you represent Jesus in everything that you say and you do. 
The world is watching. Another thing the world is watching, and I think the church has done itself a disservice, do we walk the walk or do we just talk the talk? You know, one of the things that's damaged the church across many, many years is the perceived hypocrisy of the church when it says one thing and it does something completely different. I read my Bible. Jesus said he was going to do something and he did it. I don't read anywhere in Scripture where Jesus says, oh, I'm going to go and do this and then doesn't do it. You know, Scripture tells us to let our yes be yes, now no be no. But when the world that is watching sees us and they already come with all this baggage of hypocrisy and they see us and we don't walk the walk, then they're like, huh, told you, bunch of phonies, bunch of hypocrites. What do I want anything to do with them for? That's what the world is saying. But Titus 1.6 says this, They claim, I know God, but their actions are a slap to his face. They are wretched, disobedient, and useless to any worthwhile cause. Let's not be that kind of church. Let's not be those ambassadors of Jesus. Now, sometimes, sometimes we're not going to follow through. And that is human nature. But let our desire to constantly be that we will walk the walk. That if we talk a big game, let's back it up and walk a big game and live a big game when it comes to representing Jesus. Last one for you. Do they obey the laws of the land? There's been a lot of debate in the last five or so years when it comes to the church and governmental leaders around the world. A lot of debate on same-sex marriage, around COVID and vaccination. If you want to go into, you know, some extremes, you know, there's a whole bunch of extremes. I'm not going there this morning. But Scripture makes it very clear. We are to submit to the governing authorities of the land. Scripture makes that very clear. It's not our choice whether we submit to government or not because they are appointed by God. They are his appointees for a season and it's all to do with his master plan for mankind. I will put some fine print there and say if it goes, the government goes against the truth of God's word, then we as his church rise up. Beyond that, just because we don't agree doesn't mean we can then go, I'm not going not to do what the government says. I'm going to go and create my own nation. My own nation out there at Martinsville. And, you know, be a, I can't remember what the terms are, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to self-govern. I don't have to worry about the laws of the land. I was talking to someone recently. They were talking about someone in Grace Church. And I'm not naming names and I'm not looking at anybody deliberately this time. But they said, oh yeah, that person's a bit of a lead foot. And I'm thinking, I don't know. Now I'll admit, you know, I might go a few k's over the speed limit every now and again on the M1. But I don't know if I'd like to have that reputation where someone goes, you're a bit of a lead foot. Because what is that doing? That's saying that person is not obeying the laws of the land. And I guarantee you that the world is watching that. The world is looking out at that. They're going, well, see, they don't obey the government. Romans 13.1 says this. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority, all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Now, they might not follow God. They might not acknowledge him. But they have been put there by God because it's part of a plan that he has. Whether that's for our city, our nation, whether it's for another nation, it doesn't matter. At that appointed time, they are in government to represent 
the people, but they are there because God put them there. God allowed them to be in that position, and that is why he says that we need to obey whoever is in government. We don't need to like them. We don't need to agree with them, but we need to obey them, and I would suggest we also need to respect them. So, as the world watches you and me, as the world watches the church, either it's being drawn to the gospel and going, I want some of that, or it's being repelled and walking away further and further from God and his church and his bride. Now you might be thinking, oh, that's a bit of pressure. It is a bit of pressure, but it's not a weight that you and I need to carry. We just need to be aware of it and we need to make sure that we've got the tools that we need to be able to navigate through the world that is watching us. And so what I want to do is spend some time in Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to give you some tools from the first few verses there. Before we do that, let me pause and say this. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You and I are all a work in progress. Nobody here in this room, nobody online is going to get it right every single time. The only person that got it right every single time was Jesus, and he is the one that we are representing. And that's why we need to make sure that we continually point people to him and not to you or me. That we point people to Jesus, not to the church, because the church is imperfect. Jesus is the only one that is perfect. So don't carry this thing and go, oh, I can't do all of that, I can't live up to all of that. No, you can't. But you are saved by grace. And every single day, his grace is granted to you. It's poured out upon you. You're not going to always get it right. So take a deep breath. (sighs) Go, oh, thank you, Pastor Wayne. That's fantastic. I'm feeling a little bit lighter already. Amen? Amen. All right, let's go to our passage today, Ephesians chapter 4. We are in the first six verses. It says this. Therefore I, a prisoner serving for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future." There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Great passage, isn't it? And I want to unpack it a little bit. And I want to give you those tools to equip you for the world that is watching. But before I do that, let me give you some context. The first three chapters of Ephesians... Paul is outlining, he's explaining what God did for us, how he freely died, how he's given us his grace. There's this beautiful image, and I encourage you sometime this week to go and read the first three chapters of Ephesians because it's such a beautiful picture that's created. But then in chapter 4, he's calling the church. Obviously, this is the letter to the church in Ephesus, but it's also to you and to me. But he's calling the church to live according to his plan. This is God saying, this is my plan that I have for the church. It's the right way. This is what I want the world to see. Okay, and so that's where it brings us to chapter 4. So I've got three key thoughts for you, three ways that I believe that we can be uh, the best ambassadors that we can be when it comes to representing Jesus while the world is watching. The first of those is this. Be a reflection, not a shadow. Be a reflection, not a shadow. Okay, so I want you to think about a shadow for a moment. Shadows are dark. They're a bit blurry. They have no definition. Okay, there's no detail. You can't really see everything in a shadow because there's nothing that's actually there. It leads to confusion. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in in the the next point. Okay, but reflections actually show a lot of detail. They show a lot of big details and they show a little, little details. If you've ever looked at yourself in a mirror, and I'm going to assume that everybody has, but if you look at yourself in a mirror, you get to see all the little bits and pieces 
of your face or your arm or whatever you're looking at in the mirror. You know, you go, ah, oh, new wrinkle there. I don't think that was there yesterday, was it? You know, or, you know, like this morning I was trying to, in the, I couldn't really do it because of my, my gammy eye, but I'm trying to look at my eye. So I'm going like this and, you know, I'm trying to have a look at my eye and see what's going on. But the reflection, it gives us all the intricate details of what it is that we're looking at. And so when we're a reflection of Jesus, we give the world all of his intricate details. They don't just get this big sort of shadow image of who he is or who they um, believe that he is. But when we reflect him, they get to see the real Jesus, the Jesus that you and I know, the Jesus that is grace, that is love, that is compassion, that is understanding. That's who they get to see because that's who we're reflecting to them. So I wonder if you can ask yourself, Am I reflecting Jesus? Am I reflecting the true Jesus? And here's the thing that I've noticed in my house at home, in my ensuite. I've got like one of those three-in-one lights and you turn the light on and it's very dull and you can't really see anything. But then we've got this big mirror and above the big mirror, there's a light and it's one of those spotlight ones. And as soon as you turn that on, like the bathroom just lights up, you know, like you're at the SCG when the lights are on for a night football game or something along those lines. But what that light does is it helps to see all the details of the reflection. Okay, now the Bible tells you and it tells me that we are living in the light. Okay, we are living in the light. Galatians 2.20, Romans 8.10 tells us that Christ is living in me. Christ is living in you. So if we're living in the light and Jesus is living in you and me, what is it that the world should be seeing as we reflect? They should be seeing him, shouldn't they? Isn't that what the world should be seeing? They should be seeing Jesus? That's what this verse is actually telling us. It's easy to hide in the shadows. I don't want to be a church. I don't want you to be an ambassador of Christ that is hiding in the shadows. Because we need to be shining his light. The world is dark enough as it is. Let's be carriers of his light. And let's show the world Jesus living in you and me. Philippians 2.15 says this. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Shining br like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Shining as bright lights. Shining as bright lights. We need to reflect Jesus in our life. Verse 1, I love verse 1. It says in Ephesians 4 that we are called by God. Every single person that has received Christ as their Lord is called by him to represent him. That's what you are called to do. It's not like you've got to tick the box and go, yeah, I think I'll sign up for that. When you said, Jesus, I give my life to you, you signed up for it by default. It's one of those things. You know those things you fill out sometimes and the box is already checked? It's one of those ones. The box was already checked. You already agreed. That's what I'm going to do. Everyone is called to serve and represent God. We all are. Formally, informally, in the church, in the world, spoken or unspoken, we are all called to represent him. And then it also says in verse 1, worthy of your calling. And I love how the Amplified Version actually puts this part because it says, to live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity and mature behaviour. That's what worthy of your calling means. What does it say? It says, godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, mature behaviour. Is that what the world sees in you? I wonder, is that what the world sees in me? When you have a conversation and people are like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. Guess what? The level's gone from here to here. It's not fair that it does, but that's the truth. Oh, you're a pastor. You must be perfect. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. 
Let's bring it back down here. I'm just a person who's serving God in a calling that he's asked me for a season. That's all I'm doing, and that's all you're doing as well. Wherever you are, you are called by God at a season to do and represent him at a certain time. That's all it actually is. But God is still refining you and me. He's still doing the pruning. He's still, you know, getting us to the point where we're reflecting him to the best that we can. And that's why we don't have to crumble under the weight of expectation because we know that God loves us and that we love him. And ultimately, that's all that we actually need. If the world sees a church that is in love with Jesus, if a world sees a church where they are extravagantly loved by their Heavenly Father, that's so powerful. Because for a long time the church has told the world Jesus loves you. And that's true. But I think the world's at the point where it's like, yeah, yeah, heard that. What does that mean? But when they see it, when they see the love of Jesus in action, gosh, that is powerful. That's when they go, give me some of that. I want some of that love. They can't deny our actions. All right, point number two. I've got a whole bunch more there. But we'll skip forward. Point number two. Live a spirit-filled life. Live a spirit-filled life. Here's what Scripture says. Always be humble. Always be gentle. Always be patient. Always show love. Always show peace. Those things remind you of anything? Peace. Patience, love, the amplified for gentleness as self-control. I don't know if those things remind you of anything. Anyway, I had some fruit for breakfast this morning. They're the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit of the Spirit that God is talking about. And then here's the challenge to you and to me. This is the challenge that we face. That begins with this word, always, always, always let the world see the fruit of the Spirit in you. Always let the world see patience in you. Failed, failed. Always let the world see love. Failed. Always let the world see self-control. I'm reasonably good at that one. But, you know, there's still moments where I fail. I'm sure there is for you as well. But... It's speaking of the character of Jesus. When we talk about peace and we talk about love and we talk about patience and gentleness and self-control and understanding and compassion and all everything else that is mentioned in those two verses, who does that remind you of? It reminds me of Jesus. That's who it reminds me of because he was all those things and so much more. And I think that God reminds us to always do this Because apart from him, we cannot do it. Apart from him, if we are not living a spirit-filled life, we cannot do it. We cannot show patience and compassion and love and gentleness and understanding. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why when Jesus was leaving this earth, he said, look, I'm going to leave someone with you. A comforter, a counselor, someone that's going to help you to represent me well. Because I know you can't do it by yourself. And so I'm leaving the Holy Spirit so that you can do it. And so that's what he did. He left the Holy Spirit to indwell inside you and me so that we could live a spirit-filled life that represents him well. Ephesians 5, if we go forward, actually gives us a blueprint in terms of how we can live that spirit-filled life. And it says this, verse 15, Be careful how you live. Make a choice how you live. Are you going to choose to live a spirit-filled life or are you going to choose to live a life that reflects the world that you and I live in? Because may I remind you that we're just visitors to this world. This is not our home. We are citizens of heaven, sent to this world to be ambassadors for Christ. So, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, 
but like those who are wise. Now I look at all of you here today, I see those online, you all look like very wise people, making wise choices in life. And I'm sure one of those wise choices is to live a spirit-filled life. Not to live like fools, but to live like God wants us to live. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And then it goes on, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts. Give thanks to everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Make a choice to live a Spirit-filled life. Make a choice to get up every morning and say, God, I surrender everything to you. I ask your spirit to guide each step that I take. That's a dangerous prayer to pray, but it's a courageous prayer to pray. And it helps us to represent him well. Okay, third point for you from this passage in Ephesians 4. Declare one truth. Now I've got one there in inverted commas because I want to have a look at this uh, very quickly. Because this verse tells us there is one body, there is one spirit, there is one glorious hope, there is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism, there is one God. And that's what I mean by declaring one truth. Because the world wants us to believe that we can hope in many things. The world wants us to put our faith in many things. The world wants us to believe that Jesus is just another good guy. He's not really God. Even Jesus had to put up with that. Even Jesus has his, had his identity questioned. Oh, you're not really the son of God, are you? Well, if you're the son of God, do this song and dance for me. It's no different for you and me a couple of thousand years later. But there is an eternal truth. And the truth is, the eternal truth Yesterday, today, and forevermore, the eternal truth is there is one hope, there is one faith, there is one God, there is one Lord, there is all of those ones that we just read about. And then I love that it's also for everybody, even for those who don't believe. All of those ones that we've just declared, they're for everybody because it says in that second part, Father of all, over all, in all, and living through all. It's not reserved just for you and me as followers of Jesus. It doesn't mean that anybody is, who is removed or is not walking with God cannot get to the place where they can declare the one truth. They can do that. But we've got to help them. We've got to help them get there. It's for everybody. But some people don't know. And that's why as ambassadors of Christ, as the world is watching, we have to represent him well. And we have to declare this one truth. There's no room for interpretation. God's truth is truth. It has not changed. It will not change. But here's what I see again and again in the world. They want the truth because it's good. There's good stuff in it. But they don't want the source of truth. And more and more, I'm reading things that are repackaged biblical truth, but it's packaged in a way that the world can consume it. And so what does that do? It says, well, yeah, I can just take that on board. Oh, okay, be thankful. Yeah, I'll be thankful. But why? For what purpose are you thankful? Oh, I'm thankful, you know, because I've got a big house and a nice car and blah, 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 blah. I'm thankful for the things of the world. But that's not what we're instructed to do. We're a bit, we might get the blessings of God, but we're thankful because we are saved by grace. Because Christ is our Lord and our Saviour. There's no kingdom mindset when the world repackages God's truth because they've got rid of the one. There's no longer a one, there's an everything. And we see that in truth. And I know I've spoken on this before. Truth is no longer an absolute. Make up your own truth. That's okay. I won't go there. 
2 Timothy 4.3, I think, very much describes the world that you and I live in. For a time is coming, and I'm going to suggest the time is already here, when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Breaks my heart that that is some elements of the church as well. Has drifted away from God's eternal truth and is now just scratching the ears of the world because they think that's actually how you reach the world. But do you know what? The world is actually searching for something different. The world is searching and if we just give them a watered down gospel, that's no different than the world that they live in. And that's part of what I was talking about, a shadow. Let's not be a church that is a shadow of God's truth. Didn't work out too well for the church in Laodicea. You know, they were rebuked for being lukewarm. Why? Because they didn't continue to declare one truth. They went, oh, a little bit wishy-washy. We want to make sure, you know, we're reaching our people. But I cannot and Jackie cannot and hopefully you cannot be in a church where we are tickling the itchy ear. We will give you truth and truth and truth and truth and truth because it is God's truth. It's not my truth, it's not your truth, it's his truth and it's eternal. And we will not deviate from his truth. And sometimes his truth is fantastic. And sometimes it's really hard to digest. And sometimes it makes us feel really good. And sometimes it actually convicts us. And sometimes it's comfortable. And sometimes it's really, really uncomfortable. But it's in its entirety, it is his truth. And so we anchor in the truth of his word and we declare those ones. Verse 4 of the world says, they will reject the truth and chase after myths. Sadly, that's the world that we're living in. And as the church, if the church, if followers, ambassadors of Jesus they water down and dilute his truth the truth becomes a myth and then the world remains as lost as it's always been so let's declare one truth God's eternal truth I want to say this though how we do that the method that we use can change The message and the mission of the church never changes. And so, you know that I'll say from time to time about our online presence. That's a changing method. We've not deviated any way, shape or form from God's eternal truth. But there are people that are not coming into church and so we as the church need to go to where the people are. And being online through a podcast or YouTube or whatever it might be is one way for us to do that. Our community outreach Sundays are another way for us to do that. We want to be deliberate when it comes to us as a church. But I want to also encourage you not to shy away from declaring God's truth. Verse 5 of 2 Timothy says this, But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord, work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. Fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. But make sure it's seasoned with grace, not Bible bashing. The truth doesn't change. But let's season our words and our actions with his grace because that's what the word needs. But... I will also say this, do not be surprised as you do that, that your truth is rejected. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But people who aren't spiritual, those of the world, can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. So as you stand on God's eternal truth, you'll be mocked. You'll be ridiculed, you'll be laughed at, your identity will be questioned, there'll be a whole bunch of negative things that are said about you. But I want to remind you that you're in good company because all that and so much more happened to Jesus. 
And if we're to be like Jesus in the world, then sometimes the world that doesn't understand his truth, they're going to mock us and ridicule us. But that doesn't mean that we water down his truth or we walk away from it. It means we stand firm, we remain steadfast, we stand in his truth. And when the world sees that, the world that is watching sees that, it does something. They go, huh, these guys are not just talking the talk, they're walking the walk, they're backing up what they say. We don't agree with it. We think they're fruitcakes. But gosh, we respect the fact that they're actually standing up for what they believe. And that's what happened with Stephen, with the Pharisees. He stood up for what he believed, he died for it, but he didn't waver from the one truth that God is God and he is our only way to eternal salvation so as we finish this morning I want to just remind you that the world is watching it's either an opportunity for you to freak out or it's an opportunity for you to go well it gives me a chance to actually reflect Jesus gives me a chance to be his ambassador. It gives me a chance to reveal Jesus to the world that is watching. Hopefully, you take the latter of those two things. Freak out to begin with if you need to, but then remember that how you live, that what you do, that what you say, what you allow to come out of your mouths, the world is watching all of that. And I want you to remember to reflect Jesus in all of that and so very much more. That's why it's so important to stay close to him, connected to the vine, because then we can represent him well. So I had to reflect on that as I was sitting at the airport in Santo, having had a conversation with this taxi driver about my time in Port Orly. I'm thinking, did I act poorly? Or did I represent Jesus well? What did this taxi driver who was sitting across from me having his rice and fish, what did he see in me? And as I reflected upon it, hopefully, honestly and, you know, realistically, I think he would have seen a man who loved his family. I think he would have seen a man who was enjoying his surroundings and where he was. I think he would have seen a man that was just marvelling at God's creation. He was just having a time of rest. And hopefully, he was seeing the light of Jesus in me. I didn't get a chance to ask him, but that was my hope. And that's my hope for you as well, as the world is watching. That they are seeing all of the goodness of God in everything that you say and you do. Because that needs to be our goal, whether it's the neighbour, whether it's the shop assistant, whether it's the doctor, whoever it is. Are they seeing Jesus in you? Are you reflecting Jesus at every opportunity? Are you choosing to live in his light, bringing the light of Jesus into the dark, dark world that we live in? Are you living a spirit-filled life where the goodness of God is not something that you have to think about, it's just something that comes out of you? Because God is good and his spirit is indwelling inside you. And so that's what people are seeing. Are you steadfast in your faith? Refusing to allow the voices of untruth to draw you away from his one eternal truth. Those are just questions for you to consider. Because church, the world is watching. The world is watching. You might not notice it, you might not see it, but I promise you it is taking place. And my hope, and maybe it's a challenge for you, is that as the world is watching, they always see Jesus in you. And I remind you, that doesn't mean you're perfect, doesn't mean you get it right all the time. It doesn't mean any of that. All it means is that you are reflecting Jesus and who he is. So when we do that, we make Jesus known. We make Jesus known to a world that is searching for something that they don't know what it is, but you and I have the answer to the questions they're asking. It's all in this name that's behind me, J-E-S-U-S, it's Jesus. We can either help the world continue down the rocky road that they are already on, or we can get them straight onto Straight Street, and they can make known the path for them, the road for them, to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. 
It's a fantastic opportunity, church. Let's grab it with both hands and let's be the best ambassadors for Christ we can be. <laughs>